Olá, bem-vindas e bem-vindos. Hello, welcome to the first debate of the Vanishing Rio, the Fading Away Rio. It's a partnership between Cinemateca do Mans and Rio Memórias, a virtual museum. It's also an event uh, happening at the same time as uh, UIA, uh, uh, the uh, International Architects Conference, which started yesterday and will go until uh, July 22nd. The purpose of uh, this uh, exhibit is to think about radical urban changes through which Rio de Janeiro passed since its foundation, more specifically in these last 100 years. Our proposal is to look back based on three films, which are available on Vimeo at the Cinemateca of Rio. They are uh, our so sovereigns in Brazil. This is a uh, unheard of film. It's uh, have never been released and it is part of the Belgian uh, movie library. Then it is the dismantling of the hill, talking about the demolition of the Castelo River and the chronic of demolition, talking about the uh, destruction of Rio. And uh, it's important to talk about this specifically because we are talking about a change in Rio de Janeiro. The program has been approved. So this is, of course, a parallel event to uh, UEI, this event where we are discussing exactly these changes in cities. I would like to thank uh, Schwarzel, uh, the uh, director of MAM, the Museum of Modern Art, and also Hernani Hefner who is the manager of the Cinemateca and also responsible and has helped me so much in this partnership to hold this exhibit. So I will invite Hernani Hefner to join us. And Hernani, as I said, he is the manager of Cinemateca and he started his career at Cinedia and then, and he joined uh, Cinemateca going through a curatorship. He was the head conservative of the uh, film uh, collection, and then he became the director of the film library or Cinemateca, as we say in Portuguese. Thank you so much for your participation. Now we thank you. It is a privilege to participate in uh, this exhibit, these films, this conference. And we do it in a collaborative manner, doing this as an interface between a preservation work and uh, the uh, film library work. And uh, the presentation of these documents, in this case, more specifically regarding the city of Rio de Janeiro and the uh, urban uh, aspects of Rio de Janeiro, and to bring greater visibility to the work that we are doing within our film library. We have uh, 50 year old documents or 100 year old documents. And sometimes these documents are unheard of for the larger public. Sometimes they are presented uh, out of context. So this partnership with Human Modis will uh, give meaning not only to the maintenance and conservation of this kind of uh, collection, but also the logic of bringing this back to uh, the uh, social and cultural situation and history of Rio, and maybe seeing this in the backdrop of the International Architecture Conference, the uh, UIA, which will then create this possibility for us to think and rethink uh, where we live, where we dwell, and this uh, city in which we have a daily living that can be revisited through these three films, these three films, which in a certain way will talk about this uh, story or maybe rethink the story of Rio de Janeiro, offering to the public the possibility of um, thinking about all this, where I live, how I live, and why is the city transforming so much? And what is the meaning of these transformations? I, should I interfere here and now, here and now in this process? And where I want to take the city of Rio de Janeiro in the future. So this is an opportunity, an important opportunity 
a rare opportunity, but I would really love to see this uh, repeated many, many times. And in a certain way, I think it's already being uh, repeating itself in the partnership with Rio Memoria, uh, in other partnerships and other events. And it is the possibility here of opening a debate, extraordinary debate, to help us uh, go into the details of the value of the sense and the information of a historic nature that this kind of document, which is a film or media, which is film, can offer for a general knowledge and understanding of the city. Thank you very much. Uh, so cities that are uh, always changing, you know, these uh, films that are so rare, these images from the 1920s, and uh, really allow us to rethink about what we have in our hands. I would like to invite architect and my dear friend, Luis Fernando Jandol, is a professor of architecture and urbanism at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He's a member of the organizing committee of the 27th UIA. Uh, and he is also Jandol, coordinator of the architecture uh, uh, prize uh, for uh, in Brazil. So he has a lot of work, I guess, plus all the other activities I know you have in your day. So welcome, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. I thank you, Livia, for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate along with you in this uh, project. It's a wonderful project that we have been uh, hosting for uh, two years, I guess, uh, when we were starting to organize the event. And Livia came to me and uh, she wanted uh, to talk about the proposal of bringing together in the uh, in this parallel event that would uh, deal with three important topics for our knowledge, not only uh, in terms of the architects who are participating in this conference, and these are, we have Brazilian and foreign architects, we have architects from all over the world who will uh, have a better opportunity to understand what it means, uh, what is the transformation of the city of Rio de Janeiro throughout the centuries, and also, and especially, for us to be able to reflect upon uh, due to these transformations that uh, what uh, the, what does the future hold for all of us? It's also interesting, Olivia. Oh, well, first, uh, I must not forget, I want to highlight the pleasure of being here, uh, sharing the screen with Hanani Hefner a person who I admire and have admired for many years, and our very knowledgeable historian, Fred Coelho, who will certainly bring all his knowledge and spill it upon you. And so I will just give a support. I will do the kickoff, and I don't, I'll just wait to hear all the wonderful things he has to say. Maybe if I am able to uh, help him and support him. So, Olivia, with the two of them, it's going to be a wonderful debate. I'm under the impression that uh, within this uh, context, it was certainly a positive issue in terms of generating, of uh, forming the new generations, and also to consider that you can't really think about the future without having a notion of what happened in the past. This is what inspired me. This is uh, a dream of the virtual museum Rio Memorias to revisit the past in order to think about the future of the city. And this is what is basic to all of you and all of you. Uh, and I say as a professor that you can never uh, separate yourself from your history. history was part of any kind of transformation, not only individual transformation, but especially a transformation in society where uh, we have our cities inserted around the world through its different manifestations, cultural or uh, specificities, its idiosyncrasies of every order and nature. Now, let's let everyone talk so that we can uh, go directly into our topic. Thank you so much, Jan, and thank you for making it possible to have a partnership with uh, UIA. You were responsible uh, for inserting us as a parallel event to the conference. So we'd like to invite now a historian, uh, Frederick Coelho. He's a historian, but he has a PhD and also in literature. 
He is a professor at the Catholic University of Rio. He was assistant curator of the Modern, Museum of Modern Art. He is currently the uh, uh, director of the uh, Solar Museum of Pugahiu. And he was also my uh, thesis uh, guide in the literature. So it was, it was wonderful working with him. And I thank you, him so much for his partnership. And then I also found out at a coincidence that we had a research in terms of the visiting of the uh, Belgian uh, sovereigns to, to Rio. So you see how life is. We are taken to amazing uh, paths. So Fred, welcome. I'm sure that this conversation will be uh, rich, and I will pass the floor to Ernani, who will mediate this uh, roundtable. So thank you so much for your presence. Good evening. I will allow Ernani to start working because I have amazing people here. And I have two absolute masters here in their different areas and Brazilian culture, Brazilian thought. So let's, let's go straight to the topic. And uh, so we can think about history together. So let's kick off. Thank you so much for your presentation. So we're here to talk about mainly, but not only about this, this uh, film. This is a film that is very unknown, be it in Brazil or even in uh, Belgium, uh, where the film was produced, actually. It is called uh, No Souverain au Brésil, Our Sovereigns in Brazil. And this was a production made by the uh, photography and film uh, services of the Belgium Army. This film was just to document, to register the trip of the uh, royal couple to Brazil. Uh, within a uh, setting, a set of circumstances, which uh, Fred will talk to us about. And this is a film that one century later, later is not only a historical document, it is also uh, very revealing because a number of elements of a Brazilian life and the Brazilian history and uh, Brazilian culture which still to this day are very uh, unknown to all of us and eventually do not have a uh, document support that could eventually bring that immediate presence, that click, when you talk about maybe a ship that will uh, be here in Brazil during the old Republic. Republic. But uh, you don't have a visual reference that is more detailed or immediate or direct reference of a ship such as the Sao Paulo ship, uh, a ship regarding or a ship talking about the uh, Brazilian social life, especially in the first half of the 20th century is a very rare. And uh, especially if you go back into the 19th century when films became a communication means, a form of registering and expressing and uh, gaining more and more importance as we evolved in the 20th century. But for us, this kind of a documentation was lost in time. And we do not have that much access to the films that were produced by foreigners, which in one way or the other uh, registered some events, some situations, some uh, areas and places of our country uh, in uh, these older times, so to speak. So the visit of the Belgian kings at the time was surrounded of many different circumstances, but today it's a historical fact that is sometimes forgotten and uh, unduly so, I believe. So I would like to start by asking Fred, or asking Fred to give us a panorama, an introduction, putting into context uh, who are these uh, kings? Uh, who are these sovereigns? Uh, what they? Why? Why were they here? What was the meaning uh, behind this visit at that time? And how does do do you, Fred, see? Maybe later on in your answer, you see this representation of the military, uh, the Belgian militaries did of this visit through the film that you can watch uh, on the digital channel of uh, the Cinemateca, our film library. Yeah, Hernani. This is an event which, uh, if you think too much about the, uh, the time, we can't even understand uh, that today 
it is uh, not as well known for Brazilians, especially of the uh, those who live in Rio. So let's start by the beginning. King Albert uh, had left all the uh, struggles of the first uh, war. He was called the uh, warrior king because, or soldier king, because he was one of the few who actually fought alongside his, uh, his people in the military confrontations. But there was a uh, political uh, importance and also an economic issue. When Belgium was invaded by uh, Germany, Brazil, Brazil, these things happened. Brazil was the first country to publicly support Belgium because of the invasion. And uh, so this was somehow branded in the memory and the diplomatic uh, registers. So in 1920, uh, 1919, there was a famous conference of Versailles where territories were divided. And in this conference, Epitacio Pessoa represented Brazil on behalf of Uri Barbosa. Uri Barbosa wanted to go, but was unable. So Epitacio Pessoa goes to this conference and he invites according to reports, he invites King Albert to visit the country. And the next year, he becomes president of Brazil, Epitacio Pessoa. So it was sort of, uh, I would say, a, article, uh, a maneuvered, a political uh, maneuver. So in 1920, Brazil was still an economic force because of coffee, basically. So it was a country that was considered until today, I guess, as a country of the future, a supplier of raw material and uh, inputs, even though Belgium uh, was seen at the time as one of the great industrial parks in Europe, which would need Brazilian input and, and resources. And maybe Belgium, Belgium would see itself also like that in this relation. So the, the visit of King Albert is surrounded by political aspects because they were the first sovereigns, representatives, so to speak, of uh, leaders, political leaders, uh, European uh, leaders who would visit the Brazil, which by then was a republic. So this, of course, uh, there was this all economic uh, side to it, which ended with uh, the visit uh, to also Minas Gerais and Belo Horizonte, where business well, where people actually came down to business. And then uh, they uh, created the company such as uh, Belgo Mineira. It's a Belgium uh, Minas uh, mining company. But, you know, just as food for thought before I pass you the floor back to you, how contradictory it was that at the time that the Brazilian Republic was being created, trying to mirror liberal regime, especially in the United States, but even more so uh, from the uh, French civilization, the coming of a monarch will completely change a number of structures and representations that this republic was trying to build the, little by little in this period. So what we see on the film, those big receptions and balls and the number of people, you know, surrounding the uh, Belgium committee, uh, it was something that, you know, critics, critics would criticize at the time because it was a strange situation say, using this, this word, you know, politicians would say, you know, trying to uh, putting themselves as subjects to the European monarch, especially the Belgium monarchy. So the arrival of the Belgium sovereigns here was a long, they went to Rio de Janeiro, Petropolis, Sao Paulo, Belo Horizonte, and it was surrounded by a number of celebrations and parties and balls and uh, receptions officially that could, uh, anything that could be done officially, but at the same time, and this is an interesting thing behind this, that this film, and then Andy will talk about this, it is the uh, official approach filmed by sergeants that were uh, filmmakers and sergeants at the uh, Belgium army, it doesn't show exactly the city of Rio de Janeiro, but the city of Rio de Janeiro was living many changes because of all the transformations, urban transformations that were happening very fast by Carlos Sampaio's mayorship generating the uh, expression that we read, uh, especially in magazines and uh, like Malio and Careta, which was uh, just uh, for the king to see, that things were done just for the king to see. So this is, uh, it was a, an important visit of an important monarch, and he was a sort of speak a pop star for the time due to his uh, heroic participation in the war. Economic interest was also behind this visit, and uh, also 
uh, Republican regime wanting to have international visibility through a monarch, you know, uh, submitting itself to all the ideas and possibilities that you could uh, bring to uh, receiving and welcoming the royal couple, uh, Alberto and Elizabeth. It's very significant, especially uh, we talk about the reception. We've seen the film, many receptions. I guess it's seven uh, balls or receptions, and how much these receptions were organized as an imperial uh, home. Uh, you know, it's a garden party in the gardens of the Kateti Palace, which was the presidential palace, and all this ritual and protocol that is more to a, a European uh, than uh, for a young republic, like Brazil was at the time. But you talk about the changes in Rio, we can also consider from a Brazilian perspective, we can consider if there is the invitation, what can we offer as a backdrop? What can we offer as a performance? What can uh, we offer in terms of the image of Brazil? And at least in Rio de Janeiro, which then was the capital of the country and uh, living its uh, young Republican life, living a set of transformations which will gain a more uh, crisp image, impacting image, given the architectural and urbanistic approach. So Luis Fernando, how do you see now uh, when the, the oh, at the time when the Belgian monarchs were visiting, how do you see this development of a new urban image uh, for the Brazilian uh, capital at the time. And how do you see this uh, being shown or not shown in the films uh, that captured by the uh, Belgium military? I was surprised by the film in different aspects because even though it was a trip, which in and of itself has a continuity because the trip is made of different moments, representing facts. And uh, this uh, trajectory, which the Belgian king and his wife, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, and uh, this is the famous Queen Elizabeth from uh, a neighborhood in Rio de Janeiro, because people think that it's Queen Elizabeth of England, but it isn't. It is the Belgium uh, queen who actually was uh, the street was named after and all the different paths and journeys they did here in one way or the other they are represented in this film but they show in a frag they're seen in a fragmented way and i ask myself why what was the perception that the king might have had of the places he visited given the speed through which they he would appreciate things and certain specificities that are quite interesting to understand and it's surprising sometimes when you see uh, him coming around not only the federal capital which was the city of Rio de Janeiro uh, it was a federal district so to speak and also uh, going to Sao Paulo, which was the birth of uh, industrialization in Brazil, beginning to show its strength and power here in Brazil. And not by chance, there was already uh, the uh, Matarazzo industry, the traditional family. While here in Rio, you also had the Gingli family, which would explore the Santos port, but who was uh, very present with the French culture in Rio de Janeiro, uh, here in Rio de Janeiro. So, and when, once again, they would just add to the immense transformation that the Republic uh, had when it breaks, not only politically, but also physically and territorially with the empire with the arrival of Rodriguez Alves and Pereira Passos uh, in the beginning of the century, 1902 to uh, 1906, when important changes and the greatest transformation, urban transformations happened at the time in Rio de Janeiro. And the first feature of this French culture was in the opening of the so-called Central Avenue, which then became Avenida Rio Branco in 20, uh, 1912. And it would bring along with this opening 
all a uh, process to have a more systematized life, concentrating the life of the city following a model that would value the image, not only for Brazil, but also for uh, foreign countries. And many times this, these are the valuation thanks to the presence of a relation still present at the time of the imperial times, which was the relation between the slave owner and the enslaved person. This culture of submission of the peoples was very present still at the time, and not by chance that even with the uh, movement of the so-called rebellions, which did have, happen at the time, the rebellion of the Navy in 1910 and the vaccine rebellion against technology and science, which was happening at the time. It seems like we're all almost relieving, reliving that nightmare, but, but now the campaign is against it. At the time, the government wanted to uh, develop a campaign in favor of the vaccine. Now we have a government that is going against vaccines. So all this mechanism will bring about uh, the communication means what where what you could see through the communication means this transformation in brazil of brazil wanting to reach a higher position in the world higher up so to speak through these exhibits uh, through these visits uh, this would be something that would happen uh, maybe two years after the visit of uh, king albert to rio janeiro he will come in 1920 and uh, the uh, world exhibit for the centenary of the independence in uh, uh, 1922, the uh, monumental exhibit, which would be of the 100 years. So bringing together the best of both, world, both words, it was in this backdrop that they tried not only to open this space, that would be to remove a part of the population that was living already in decadence and those who had the opportunity of uh, seeing the second film which will be debated tomorrow you can always see uh, clearly this social difference in terms of poverty and wealth and uh, the already the tendency of expanding the city separating these social and economic classes from one another. Through uh, the train, you would have an important path of uh, population going more into the suburbs, to the northern part of the city, while the elites would go towards the south with the urban direction from Pereira Passos when you open the Beira Mar Avenue by the Sea Avenue and other things in this sense. This, uh, this whole uh, enchantment with what came from overseas is truly a time in which you see it there, you know, how uh, it was present there. And then Juscelino later on would say that Brazilian people uh, Brazilian said that uh, we are looking back to the country. We are looking always overseas, trying to mirror ourselves. And that's where we would find inspiration in giving our backs to Brazil. This is one of the messages that uh, former President Juscelino Kubitschek uh, justified the construction of a capital, uh, Brazil, uh, Brasilia, in the Midwest. So this is a moment of transition for the city. However, with uh, still traits of the past. Then I will talk a little bit more about this. So let's hear from our coordinators and our historians. And uh, please correct me if I made any kind of mistake. There's one thing, uh, it's interesting, Anani. As Livia said in the beginning, I, it is a present for me to be here with you for years years, 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 years ago, I did this research considering these aspects that Jean was presenting now, which have to do with 
this uh, projection of a representation of civilization, of European civilization in the tropics, uh, based on the smaller events and the events that the Republic was producing little by little. And then we reached the Hey Alberto, the King Albert's issue. But regarding the emotions, um, I've got the removals, I'm sorry. I was looking back at my books and I saw this news from August 12, 1920, at Jornal do Brasil, one month before the arrival of the sovereigns. One of the visits that we see on the film is when they go to the Avenue Niemeyer, which is a coastal road that will connect uh, Baja da Tijuca and uh, San Conrado or Lagoa San Conrado. And you can see, and we know that it, the work was constructed when actually the uh, cycling uh, path, what ended was the arch that was built for the uh, visit of uh, King Albert. But this news where they're talking about removals and the dismantling of um, people who lived in these uh, coastal areas, they were systematically removed. And according to one of the uh, dwellers, she thought that this time they would have to leave because now it was for the King Albert. So it wasn't just a removal to uh, that they could come, keep coming back. And the, uh, the, and the uh, title is uh, work, uh, the unhuman work. So in the Brazilian media at the time, there was criticism. There was already this approach, a critical approach, not only from the standpoint, some of course saying that you had to remove everything and then get, take everyone away and do away with this uh, city. That was be the chance, that was the time. And finally, Europe is here to know us. But they would talk about this removal, uh, as we know uh, still today, and also um, giving uh, the amounts, talking about the value, saying that it was very strange. Some journalists were saying that some politicians were benefiting of the uh, of the uh, visit of uh, Alberto because they would increase and make money with that visit. So it is typically a Republican, Brazilian Republic visit of what we know about Rio. And then we will talk more about this, you know, uh, how the population saw this visit. Because see, these dismantling and removals would be happening and, since that time. And everything happened really fast. Luis Fernando and you talk about important topics here, uh, which have to do not only with social conflicts that will perpass uh, Brazilian history, uh, the uh, different, the Shibata re rebellion, the uh, Navy rebellion, the vaccine uh, rebellion, the Navy rebellion was mo done by mostly uh, uh, black Brazilians, which served in the battleship Sao Paulo, which was the ship that Brazil sent to pick up the uh, Belgium uh, kings. So we have, through this, also an opportunity of actually seeing the uh, battleship Sao Paulo where you have a military armaments and 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 uh, the, the and royalty so the cycle of those conflicts conflicts that would oppose especially popular uh, classes that were recently uh, freed from slavery and these elites which truly uh, uh french in a certain way at that time and you might remember that at that time many times, there is a lack of a more immediate report or a documentation. We don't have visual reports, especially moving images. These are very rare. And by listening to these reports, we ask ourselves, who were these people? How was their life? And how were the buildings? How was, for instance, uh, you know, a, a, a poor person's uh, hut or a small uh, joint of huts, which you then called a shanty town or a favela, and how this will establish itself on the uh, hills around Rio. So one thing that really called my attention to this is a very fast excerpt of the film, which is very important and probably has to do with the curiosity of these two uh, filmmakers, military filmmakers. Their, his perspective is a bit to discover Brazil in a certain way and reveal Brazil to a foreign uh, audience. 
It was to register in a certain way these uh, features that would be maybe a, a bit alien to them. And then the visit to Petropolis during that visit in Petro and the, the visit between Petropolis and Teresopolis, they uh, leave the committee uh, aside and they do anthropological research. They said, look, we're going to show uh, an inhabitant, a dweller, a local dweller, uh, someone that was very poor. You can see very simple clothes and maybe no shoes. And they do a panoramic uh, view to the left, showing a very uh, simple hut made of mud, which is a, uh, called Pau Apique. And this is a kind of construction that comes from the northeast of Brazil. It's kind of mud hut. And it was probably a migrant that uh, came through uh, the northeast, uh, went through the different battalions of volunteers, uh, and uh, during the incursions of Canudos, where uh, the term favela was actually uh, created. Uh, it was already a geographic, established geographic space. And then what is really, what really matters beyond this is the second uh, plan where the image shows another person uh, uh, standing. And then behind you see a popular uh, neighborhood. Uh, this is a hilly city, Petropolis, and you can clearly see that this is a very poor neighborhood. It is made of uh, small huts, mud huts, and maybe this is the first recording of a, what eventually would be called uh, later a favela in the country or a shanty town. And maybe it's the first moving image we have or recording of we have of a social space like that. And in this sense, the film is quite revealing in the sense we can even explore some of these elements here and the more specific elements in the film, understanding that the film basically, as Luis Fernando said, it follows you know, a script, which is the script of the visit of the uh, Belgian sovereigns. But it's interesting to see that the filmmakers at every given moment they try to show one or other aspects that maybe came to their attention, or eventually the, cam the camera had registered something and they had decided to include. And I started by the same element of the favela. And Fred, when we were talking uh, before this, uh, this meeting, uh, the Fluminense Stadium, the the space that became a very noble space. It was a, sea, a sacred temple of uh, the manifestations of our, our uh, republic. So at the stadium, you have a number of elements that might not be uh, noticed by most, but have a great significance. Could you comment a little bit about that, Fred? This event actually is surrounded by tension because according to the newspaper at the time, it was one of the last events that was uh, scheduled for the visit that was confirmed. It was one of the last ones confirmed because there were a number of situations for the uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, soccer, certain internal uh, struggles and different leagues, and it was a bit tense. And also at the time in 1920, there was already the presence, a greater presence, and then minimal of what we have today, a greater presence of uh, players who at the time would be called uh, dark-skinned or black. Uh, and this uh, delay, so to speak, of uh, the sporting event in the Laranjeiras Club, in the neighborhood of Laranjeiras and the Fluminense Club, had to do with that. You know, what are you going to show to a king, to a European monarch that could represent our civilization, our people. And one of the most um, dear spaces to the Brazilian people, he, but to, and to him, to the king, he was also well known uh, for being a sportsman. He went to, to Posto Seis in Copacabana to swim in public. So I uh, guess uh, Rainha Elizabeth, the avenue, was exactly where they would go to the beach, the king and his wife. But this uh, sporting event only happens because of an effort of a person who, who Jeannot referred to. It's Arnaldo Guinli. Arnaldo Guinli at the time was the president of Fluminense, and he was one of the central figures of Rio de Janeiro. And that's, they start uh, talking about with Itamaraty, with the foreign relations uh, 
our foreign relations our ministry and also uh, newspapers pressuring uh, the confederation to have a sporting event for the king because today it doesn't make sense or maybe it does according to the quality of our current uh, soccer but uh, soccer was a European um, a European sport, especially from uh, coming from England uh, to Rio de Janeiro. It was an elite sport, which little by little was transforming. And the game actually, which take place of soccer games, which actually happens as a main attraction of this event, and it was of course crowded to the top, was a uh, North Zone team from a South Zone team. Uh, there were a number of clubs such as Andaraí, Mangueira, Helenico, these clubs were the northern part of town. And the south zone had a number of clubs. And they, uh, I guess we do have a soccer field right in front of the palace, starting next to it, which was a Paisandu. It's the name of the street, actually, where they arrive. So this event, this soccer game, becomes a, an event of the Brazilian Confederation of Sports. And so we have teams, uh, rowing teams, athletes, other teams such as, uh, there was a uh, field hockey even, and it's uh, interesting. You can see hockey, field hockey uh, bats. Or, uh, so you can see that the main sports in Rio de Janeiro, which were replaced by, uh, by soccer were uh, rowing, automobile races, which happen at the neighborhood of Gavia, and also uh, turf, so or uh, horse race, which had a greater frequency, of course, when this is also seen. And uh, this uh, soccer event, which is the news that actually brought me to research King Albert, is that some uh, newspapers at the time were saying that there was a great resistance that the presidency of the Republic had due because of this event and the foreign relations uh, ministry, about the possibility of having participants that would be of uh, darker skin. And these were popular, more uh, poor people who were now starting to play stalker. And that would end up um, conveying the wrong message, so to speak, uh, to uh, the uh, king. Uh, and uh, and uh, the racist thought of the time had resistances. It's important to remember that the presence of King Albert was in the Brazilian Republican context, which was uh, putting into context a, a militarized, racist kind of line of thought, even though we were in a republic uh, from the uh, civil, uh, civil civilization aspect, we were quite forward, but we always have the uh, sort of separation, military, uh, legal aspects, and of course, racist. Uh, in terms of a city that uh, jean said, that was pushing away, trying to erase any kind of trace of a poor population. And of course, these were, of course, descendants of enslaved people. And in the small universe where uh, Hale Beato uh, circulated, said, well, he will come to see the Rio presented by Carlos Sampaio and Epitácio, so he won't get to know Rio de Janeiro. They wanted uh, to have King Albert visiting the uh, carnival blocks. And Epitacio Pessoa said, no, they vetoed that idea. There's this guy from Rio Grande do Sul who wanted to bring a uh, party from Rio Grande do Sul and Itamarachi, the foreign relations ministry, also vetoed that idea. So a number of ideas circulated. So you can see the opportunity of showing yourself to a king. So the protocol was strict. And this uh, sporting event, because of that, because King Albert had to see the strength of the Brazilian youth with all the athletic heirs. But just to conclude, the newspapers after events said that it was shameful, shameful to see the king, the Belgians, and the Brazilian population playing uh, soccer at the time. And this is also a funny thing. And some of the editorials highlighted how the politicians, Brazilian politicians close to King Albert were pathetic, sad, Oh, this was the uh, capital of the Republic. You had senators from all the country and congressmen and everybody. You have this uh, very strange figures with uh, King Albert, just to open a little bit more. So just, to, you know, King Albert was a sportsman, tall, athletic, heroic, a soldier, bringing this idea of a, a cruel idea of Europe for the Brazilian level at the time. Yes, undoubtedly. Yes, Renaud, go ahead. 
I believe, first, I would like to compliment the beginning of Fred's presentation because he talked about the stadium belonging to my team, Fluminense, the three-color team. It's just a historical fact, Geno. It's not about soccer. Uh, it, it was passional also. Nelson Rodriguez would say that this already existed 45 minutes before nothing. So what we're talking about that, um, this is already an idea of what the society represented, this industrial society represented, linked to the progress of society, uh, which had the Ginglings. The, what the Ginglings left as a legacy in Rio de Janeiro is amazing. But I would like to highlight one of the uh, points which I find essential when it's more of a conceptual nature regarding the city so that we um, can better understand truly what are the different meanings of the city to understand why certain things happen at given moments. I always say, and I insist, that the city is a living organism and it is permanently changing. And this is a fact, it's undoubtedly. It's a living organism and it is permanent transformation. And in the sense, we have to look into history and we will see that cities, until proven wrong, cities will reflect societies that are stratified within their own territory in history. What a city is, a city is a reflection of societies that are stratified in these locales all throughout history. In the history of Brazil, we will have from the uh, period of colonization until the current period, we will have different um, society models which were present and uh, which transformed and uh, brought different functions to what we call urban spaces, which are different from other spaces. So in the 20th century to us and to the world was a century of a profound transformations, industrialization, which had already started in a very uh, small way, gains pro uh, immense proportions, especially in the US. Therefore, we start transforming some of the important values which will reflect on the type of growth that the city will have uh, given uh, the industrialization. And the first reflex that we can actually see in this model in the 20th century is a verticalization. And it's curious, curious to note that in uh, 1906, uh, when uh, the Rio Branco uh, was uh, built a portico of uh, Pereira Passos for having uh, worked in Paris uh, during the Osman period, and uh, he brought all this, this is a, and of course, eclectic style, which is different, but there was a certain um, monument aspect to it. And it starts transforming itself still under that style in a verticalization of the city. And notice this one thing, you know, what happens when we establish that uh, the visit of King Albert starts in the beginning of the 20s, uh, even though he came in September and he was here um, uh, through September till November, this 1920 is already branding, creating the period of a new culture, which already starts separating itself from the French culture, which is present still, of course, the French culture is still present in the elites and continue to build and projecting uh, using this uh, French language, not by chance, they invited, he invited Joseph D to project and to create a number of extraordinary buildings here. And when uh, transforming, you start seeing that the first impact 
is the transformation of one of the extremities of Rio Branco Avenue, which by then had already this name, where today is Cinelândia, which is a Serrador block. The Serrador block had a direct influence, direct influence of American values, of Broadway, of uh, movie theaters, theaters, uh, people walking around, admiration, people coming together that were uh, focused on a certain uh, aspect of occupying an urban space. And uh, the buildings are then built uh, from six floors up. Six floors was the, was, was the average, I guess the largest buildings in Rio were six, seven floors. Uh, representing, of course, the uh, architecture of, uh, in France, which was approximately that high, too. So when they do that, Serrador uh, already uh, projects uh, buildings of 14 uh, floors for Cinelândia, for the Cinelândia uh, block. So this is advance of concrete. This is when uh, concrete comes to have a place here. So 24 and 25 is when Cinelândia is built. And at the same time, the verticalization uh, through the use of concrete will also be uh, built on the extreme, uh, the extreme opposite of the avenue where people actually arrive in the port of Rio de Janeiro to show that when you arrive on your ship, uh, what Brazil was, the power, the capital, with uh, the building Anoite with 22 floors, reflecting the largest, the tallest building in Latin America at the time, and the tallest building in the world with a concrete structure. In the United States, you know, it's a steel structure. And not by chance that the real estate market starts growing at that time. And not by chance, King Albert, uh, comes to install the Belgo, uh, the Belgium uh, Mineiro Mining Company, Belgo Mineira Mining Company, which was an immense power in Brazil for many years, was one of the largest suppliers of steel uh, for civil construction. Until very recently, all uh, iron was by Belgo Mineira, because in the beginning there was no competition. It was Belgo Mineira which would produce. So he doesn't leave here, you know, going to Minas Gerais from Rio. He went to negotiate, yes, this company of uh, the steel company. So what did he go to do in Sao Paulo? It was the policy of the so-called café con leche, coffee and milk. If these two poles were in a power, so he will go to find the strength of the Sao Paulo industry also to strengthen this important company, mining company, which had a Belgium uh, origin and against yet another significance and a stronger one in Brazil that will only be broken in the Vargas government much, much later uh, with uh, the so-called National Mining Company, Siderurgica Nacional. So this process of industrialization will show how the city starts to transform itself so abruptly through the presence of an automobile. And that needs, of course, steel, iron, and uh, that, that's why Ford was also talking about its mechanic. But if he went to Petropolis in order to also uh, revere uh, the Brazilian monarchy, we don't know. But you, as historians, have to explain, what did he go to do in Campinas, the city inland of Sao Paulo? <laughs> Hernani has a very good hypothesis about why he went to Campinas uh, when we talked the other day about thinking about a film made by military uh, film uh, filmmakers. I thought it was an interesting perspective. I guess the film, in a certain way, brings these elements that both you, Fred, as well as Luis Fernando brought, which is to organize a, a register, a diplomatic trip a commercial trip in an official, of course, very solemn tone, but at the same time have the ability 
of having the perception of those who are preparing the film. These are, of course, two uh, filmmakers, but from a background linked to the uh, Belgian army, which I probably don't know their history, they're two filmmakers, but it's already significant to consider that this film was thought to have two cameras rolling at the same time, simultaneous, so the production strategy was already uh, very rare at the time. Uh, very rare at the time. And also showing the importance that the uh, Belgium uh, government would give to this kind of trip. To having two, two cameras would be to have the ability of covering uh, these uh, facts. So if the uh, uh, king is going in front of a certain building, a certain area, and will maybe uh, go step down from the car. And most of the, even the transportation are still uh, boogies uh, at the time, horse drawn boogies, that is, because probably the Brazilian wanted to have all this uh, pomp and circumstance of European monarchies and receive them accordingly. Uh, so eventually, if the king uh, was going to step down from the transportation, be it a horse drawn boogie or a, a car, the second uh, filmmaker is already going uh, uh, beforehand so he can record the king coming down from the vehicle without any kind of gaps or and the film is very detailed in the sense uh, with all that did happen during this visit they just don't film the uh, inside of the buildings be maybe because of technical issues so we don't see the signing of protocols or contracts and also the uh the the balls or the commemorations uh at night weren't either filmed weren't filmed there was a venetian a ball also in the botafogo bay but it was difficult due to the technical uh, specificities at the time and of course so there were technical issues that you were were unable to overcome so you have you didn't have reflectors at the time but uh as much as possible according to their limitations they truly uh, create the necessary conditions to have a, a full recording. And this approach of uh, two military filmographers over a world that they probably didn't know of, Brazil, will emphasize aspects that have to do with their daily lives. There were, I mean, great military parades or uh, cavalry parades or infantry parades, this kind of thing. Uh, the film has that too, but it, probably that was their experience. And beyond, besides that, uh, King Albert was a cavalryman. So he had this interest. Uh, he had an insertion inside the Belgium army specifically. And not by chance, you have that sequence, you know, of uh, the uh, Derby Club, which was in Maracanã, where you have a horse race. Only five years later after the visit, you will build uh, the famous uh, Gavia Hypodrome. Uh, taking uh, from the northern part of the city and breaking to the south part, a very noble uh, sport of uh, European monarchies. And uh, they uh, filmed a horse race, but also they filmed a present of the Brazilian government to the kings, which is, of course, uh, horses. And they also film how Brazilian horses are, how they uh, tame Brazilian horses, so this is the um, more rural universe of the visit, and we can see in the film. So it's even strange. That's why they go all the way to Campinas, and then they go specifically to the neighborhood of Pinheiros. And the advantage of doing it live and being able to have the internet next to us, I found here, uh, and it's referred to, actually, they were going to a... a, a, a a Guaratapá farm, and on the way to Guaratapá, they go through Campinas. So they were going to Guaratapá, but I don't know what they were doing in the Guaratapá farm. This I don't know. This is still a mystery. Probably uh, they were going to get to know some kind of horse breed, specific breed, which is that sequence where they do a, you know, they lasso a horse. I guess that's the sequence we see uh, filmed there, and probably. The king had interest, had, and he and he even he goes horseback riding. We see a sequence of the king going horseback riding uh, with uh, a number of, of uh, cavalry people. So the film does have this detail, and it's revealing also things 
that probably had and didn't seem to have any importance at the time, but both you and Fred and Luis Fernando have, have emphasized, which is based on these conflicts, especially conflicts that uh, have an origin because of the vaccination issue, but become a conflict because of the occupation of the urban spaces, these conflicts will unfold in the history of the city in a very broad and specific manner. And then you see a sequence, for instance, of the Derby Club, where you have that you know panoramic view. And then you see all the hills around, in which today are famous hills. You can see the Mangueira Hill, not one single building on it, yes. There's nothing in the Mangueira, but not one single hut or house. And in our memory, it's as if it was there since ever. And it, it, you can see it at a given moment. Again, it's a new dynamic, especially on the um, 30s and 40s. And today it has a consolidated configuration, urban configuration. So this contrast, this contrast that means uh, both this uh, struggle and this occupation of urban spaces and the evolution that this has within the city, a city that will actually uh, consecrate, so to speak, the idea of a favela. So it's amazing to discover in a film such as this, images that are like this. No one went there to film the uh, hill of Mangueira, but it's there, you see it as a backdrop. But the recording of a public space like that, which was a, a derby at the time, allows us to see this, not only from that standpoint, but this is um, where Luis Fernando might also further develop this topic. He mentioned the uh, Sinai, the uh, dismantling of the hill, uh, which is the Castello Hill dismantling right next to the Rio Branco Avenue. And it's interesting that not only you see the complex of hills in the Maracana region, but you also see the hills of Laranjeiras. And we also see maybe from a uh, angle which better exposes us, uh, you can see part of the Castello uh, hill behind the Bellas Ash. This is even the, this is amazing to me because how close it was, right? I was amazed by that. It's right next to it. And Luis Fernando could explain this better. When Pereira Passos opened the so-called Central Avenue, he says in his memories, in his bi biography, he wanted to uh, bring this uh, connect the sea to the sea through a new access to uh, increase uh, three meters to become the um, largest or the widest avenue in Latin America. So there are some funny facts there. There was this uh, struggle, so to speak. But when he does this, when he presents the idea, and the idea was really to do a boulevard, a typical French boulevard with a straight line uh, connecting sea to sea, so to speak, which actually would be like a, uh, a passageway for pedestrians to show the grandeur of Rio de Janeiro. That you could, a ship could arrive on one side and you can uh, transport yourself to the other side. And people would say, what, well, well, Brazil is this? And they get, people would be uh, in awe. And when they do the first uh, line, you can see the Castelo uh, Hill is right in the middle. They would have to have a deviation. They would have to have a curve in that boulevard because it was hitting directly on the Castello uh, Hill. They would obey this cut that would follow the uh, trajectory of certain streets, allowing some uh, land to the side. One important detail is that when Pereira passes, and this is an, econ an interesting economic a play of his, when he disappropriated the area to build the so-called Avenida Central, the Central Avenue, he didn't do exclusively uh, the uh, street, but the sidewalks and the 33 meters wide that he wanted. He also disappropriated another part of the avenue all the way to the parallel neighboring uh, streets, not the transversal streets, because these lands, which were being turned towards the Central Avenue, would have an amazing valuation that would be uh, extraordinary. So he uh, did the uh, dispossession of all these buildings, and there would be many, many lands and uh, real estate. You have a very, very thin, actually, land 
there. And just to give you an idea, uh, in order not to uh, do, do work with a, a church, for instance, you have a width that only some of the, the, these lands have only two meters wide. Where, what's the name? There's this uh, square that Buenos Aires, Ovidor, there's this, uh, I can't remember now. Rua Miguel Couto, that will go all the way uh, to President Vargas. So there, there's an old church, and that block will start with seven meters in the whole and with two meters wide, where you have the Simpatia Café. The valuation of that real estate allow, allowed him to automatically refinance not only uh, the loans which were uh, obtained in uh, uh, British banks, they could also uh, pay for certain uh, construction by negotiating these uh, this land, the disappropriation of this land and selling it to a number of uh, business uh, men. Ginling, one of the Ginlings, built a hotel there and uh, it was uh, in the corner of San Jose Street in Rio Branco. So all this negotiation, was already part of a plan of a transformation that will bring this new aspect. But when you ask about the Castello Hill, they thought it would be a good idea to deviate, to maybe twist a little bit, not, not making a curve, but going a little bit uh, from the Praça Mawa in order to have a tangent and they put a good part so they ate they took a good part of the hill in order to do that they moved it and this was Pereira Passos he just cut a, you know it was like they cut the hill through and through and this is where he start he will start inserting this uh, construction that he needed to build to and to give continuity and with the demolition of the hill the dismantling of the hill because I guess the 20s was a an age of transformation and Rio de Janeiro the industry was uh, reaching progress, uh, service industry. So the dismantling of the Castelo uh, Hill uh, for whatever reasons, which might be true or no in terms of, of taking away the population and then bringing an, more air into the area was creating the area for the uh, 22 centenary exhibit and to find an amazing area for the expansion of real estate in the downtown area, undoubtedly. And in order to do this, he uh, hires Alfredo Agashi to develop this project already, considering uh, and thinking differently. Agashi already thinks about buildings uh, close uh, to the streets, defining the blocks that will be formed by a continuous of buildings and uh, having uh, central areas like you have in Barcelona and Paris with central squares inside the blocks. And, and at that time, this is what they will do. And this then it will be uh, uh, put away by all the, uh, the Corbusier modernist theories and the letters of the World uh, International Architects uh, Conferences. And uh, they just he just moves ahead and this allowed the city to uh, be de facto a permanent transformation and not always privileging the interests of society. Many times, uh, most times I would say, they would privilege economic and financial capital interests, be it real estate, especially real estate, I would say. I'm not sure if I explained it correctly. Perfectly, perfectly. And I guess this referral in terms of how much we are going uh, into a transition period at that time into modernism is an imper important reference here. The uh, Cerrador block can only be built between, it's only built between 24 and 28 uh, with the five movie theaters that will be built at the time under the bigger buildings. But Cerrador visits New York in 1918 
he will negotiate purchasing the uh, the uh, land from the covent that was there and then the land is bought in 20 and then the original project for this uh, entertainment um, neighborhood or, or the block is presented uh, in its uh, eclectic approach in 1920. This uh, small four-year period changed everything, everything. And in the sense, I would like to ask Fred, another aspect that is uh, something I came to my attention is that the rituals of Brazil, in order to, to welcome the sovereigns, were a bit uh, outdated, I would say. Uh, and after the First World War, this is a new society, especially in the West, but also reaching Europe. It's curious to note that uh, Queen Elizabeth in uh, the Belgian history is considered a bit of a pioneer in terms of the way she dressed, an image, a, uh, image of a modern woman and not of a traditional aristocrat. But she apparently comes to Brazil drain, training, uh, dressing a little bit of a traditional uh, costumes. So how do you see the presence of the uh, royal couple in these different Brazilian spaces, not only in Rio de Janeiro, but especially through the film, but also through the research that you've done? I will start with an important sentence of Levi Strauss when he came to Brazil in the beginning of the 30s, and he write uh, the, the sad tropics. He said that in, the, in the Americas, the tropics are, are more uh, dim or dead than uh, late or outdated. It is a delayed consumption of uh, an European idea which reached Brazil later. And within what Brazil, what, what Luis Fernando was saying, there was this whole mentality, a modern mentality with a modernist approach in terms of transformation, the negotiation of the greater capital of separating the French model with a more, uh, uh, to a more cosmopolitan uh, American model. And as we know, and until now, the power rituals not always correspond to the more the dynamics of the economy of society. So behind there, of course, there are different layers here. The first layer here is a great business as Luis presented. It was a big business, a business that would articulate a steel company, road building, foreign trade, uh, changes in industrial parks. This was one layer. The second layer, as we were talking about here, with the expectation of having a representation of Brazilian power. But as you said, based on a number of landmarks that would, it's a par it's paradox, you know, the Republican regime trying to present a type of reception that would be expected for a monarch. And now he's truly a monarch. It's not our former Portuguese uh, who were here and just stayed. Now we have a European monarch that can show us or can maybe uh, approve what we are building, so to speak, as a, as a civilization, as a capital with the main port of the Americas. There was always a struggle with Buenos Aires, who was the greatest port. So we see in this film, the circulation within these spaces, the receptions, Maybe the only moment where this uh, space will have a uh, separation, uh, like the, when you see Petropolis, is when we see the famous meeting at Quinta da Boa Vista. According to the papers at the time, these numbers might not be precise there, you had more than 20,000 students graduating, actually girls graduating, who were being prepared to graduate at that event. Can you imagine the importance of hymns, the songs? So it was still a, a positivist uh, uh, remains at the time. So that's an official uh, feature, but a population that wanted to come close. And this is the third layer, a population which wanted to participate in that party, to take part in that party. And the government, the official protocols, always uh, doing it uh, protectively. And we see, you know, uh, uh, we don't see this interaction throughout the film, but the news what we have until then you have the so-called uh, he he, uh, he would uh, go uh, see swimming and then he will also walk the streets and he was acclaimed when he walked the streets of Rio de Janeiro at his arrival 
you have the circuit of this new city. You leave the Praça Mauá, the port. You go down the so-called central avenida. Then you go into the Rua Paysandu, which until today, in Rio de Janeiro, for those in the Flamengo, you see the Paysandu. For a certain angle, you can see the palm trees. It will go all the way down to the Guanabara Palace, and then you reach the Guanabara Palace. But in this uh, super well-prepared and structured path, everything official, protocols, and the Foreign Relations Ministry asked the people, uh, especially in the, the, the Paysandu Street, to put you know, you know flags of Brazil and Belgium out in their balconies. But this path was completely filled with popular, with popular people, with, uh, with the population using the expression, and even the street sellers, you know, the so-called camelo is selling everything. And it's important to notice also the arrival of the Belgian kings in July, the preparation July, August, September, the time they were the motive of um, every time of, of, of trinket and product you can build to publicize, you know, uh, piggybacking uh, the uh, Belgium from, you know, tonic, hair tonic, uh, shoes, furniture, anything. Everybody was using uh, the king as a marketing tool. Everything links to the monarch. And I was talking about this before. I would talk about an amazing event, which was Evaristo da Vega championing or trying to condemn the assassins of uh, Clarices do Brasil. And he uses the arrival of the Belgian monarchs by saying, who, what would a uh, King uh, Albert or Elizabeth uh, think if he knows that a killer is still on the ground? So this is the expression, you know, what Brazil was living, and especially in Rio de Janeiro at the period lived, was a Belgium delirium. It was a Belgium delirium because the day they arrived, as uh, jean louis reminded, published, uh, no, all the, all the publishing, the newspapers were written in French. Everything in French, many stores and the, uh, you know, with, the, with their windows had personalized luxurious albums that you can, uh, you have to have in your house regarding the story of uh, the family of King Albert, the Brazilian uh, Geographic Institute gave him a title, honorary title, the uh, mayor uh, gave him also a title of uh, being a Carioca citizen. So different situations that were built and developed had this uh, game between the, what was official, uh, kind of outdated. There was a type of a gala reception. If you read in the manuals, which were published at the time, all the protocols, all the receptions that you would meet King Albert, you had to use a, a top hat. Uh, you had to use a top hat. So there was this whole protocol, the women, of uh, the politicians, you know, the Brazilian elite, the high society in Rio de Janeiro wanted to be present also. But uh, it is in the light of uh, Quincas Borbas and Machado de Assis, you know, it was a bit this mindset. This elite wanted to be part of the committee, which would be uh, serving the king, to be serving uh, the royal family while they were passing here. So let's say you are full of money, you're rich, you're Republican, but you wanted to be part of that, you know. And Lima Barreto talks about this. I guess it's called the virtues or something like that. It's an editorial where he really makes fun of this. He made fun of Republicans. So he makes fun of the Republicans saying, the problem is that Epicasso Pessoa offered 40 contos de reis for you to work because if he took away this money, everybody would stop wanting to be a royal servant. But to conclude, just another reference for those who like this matter. There's a beautiful book of Carolina Nabucco, who also lived in this uh, family, in the empire, the Gillings, and the other families. And she talks pages and pages about the uh, hype that was among uh, the high society women to be part of these big dinners, of the... Uh, uh, the celebration of the sub-court that was created surrounding these kings. And as we heard, King Albert, he wasn't open. He was easygoing. He was very popular in the sense that he walked, uh, he walked the streets, he went swimming. He went to, to the Oito Batutas concert in a lunch that happened there. Unfortunately, the film did not capture this. 
the scene, I guess. They decided to <laughs> benefit of the concert and do something else. They had to have fun. Come on, the poor uh, filmmakers. There was there was fun, I guess, in their in their stay here. Well, unfortunately, we are reaching uh, almost a year, hour and a half already talking here. And you know, our official time was one hour, and we have already gone beyond. But uh, I would like to ask Luis Fernando, Fred, as well as Lydia, to um, a brief comment, not only about the Belgian film and uh, but eventually uh, uh, some kind of referral in terms of the two other films that we will also discuss tomorrow and the day after that, which is the uh, Dismantling of the Hill and Chronicle of Demolition, which has to do with the Monroe Palace, which was the Brazilian Federal Senate at the time, uh, and uh, which was on the other uh, side of the Rio Branco Avenue. And to open the uh, so-called Beta Ma, and to invite uh, the group to watch these movies, which have many connections with this uh, portrait that the Belgian uh, film filmmakers had of Brazil. And I would specifically, Livia, if you could talk about the uh, Human Modest Virtual Museum and how these three films uh, are talked about and what is being offered in this virtual movement. And this is important for all those who are interested, not only in the past, but uh, which eventually might be maybe walking around a square or a street and, uh, and seeing these films and seeing, after seeing these films, might have an idea of what was there before and even identify something that is still there that uh, could give another feeling, another image of the city uh, through which you are passing, through which you're visiting as a tourist or as a negotiator. Before I pass the floor to Livia, I would like to make a comment. Uh, when I started my presentation today, Fred is going to laugh. I said, I'm waiting for you to uh, send me the ball so I can actually make a goal, obviously. And for all of you who are watching us, a goal de placa is to actually tomorrow participate and uh, watch the, these two films that we are going to discuss. The second one, which is the dismantling of the hill, It is a sequence, a direct sequence of this beginning of a history that we are talking about, which we broadly discussed today. And it will, of course, connect itself. It was wonderful, this choice you made of presenting these three films in the sequence. So for all of you who are watching us today, since a Fluminense played on Saturday, it was easy going. I had a free uh, Sunday to I uh, watched these two films, uh, The uh, Dismantling of the Hill and The uh, uh, Chronicle of uh, Demolition. I, I watched both, three hours duration, and I was fascinated. I had already watched it, uh, but I decided to watch again to see what uh, would how it would reflect the film of what uh, the film that we were watching today, the, our sovereigns in Brazil, and it's amazing, You're absolutely inserted. So congratulations for the sequence that you presented, and this idea that the city is a sequence of transformations. It means uh, they are very meaningful, and it's different for a film that we watched and which we commented today which is uh, a film that has no sound, no comments. But very fortunately, we have these two wonderful people commenting, which is uh, Ernani and Fred. So, but tomorrow, we have lots of uh, statements made by important people. So you can hear about what people have to do with in the uh, demolition of the hill. There are registers, so it's amazing. So don't miss it.
And in this last film, the same thing, a number of colleagues uh, from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro also comment because the director is the son of a, 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 a professor who was my professor. We taught together and he unfortunately died uh, prematurely, Lauro Jardim, and Mauro Jardim, I'm sorry. And the film is very interesting and I love these uh, films. So don't miss it, don't miss it. I want to watch it again. These films are amazing. And we uh, we uh, studied in Livia. You really, you did it. You did good, girl, in our conference. So thank you so much. It was such a hit. And I'm very happy to be part of this project, to have negotiated this way back when, and uh, to have supported uh, this, uh, this program that you created uh, so carefully with so much dedication especially with uh, so much competency. Thank you so much for having invited me to participate in this part of the program and this wonderful uh, company. Thank you, Jano, for your kind words. I will just briefly talk about it. It is an honor, of course, to me to be here with you. Uh, I will always thank you for the compliments. I know that compliments uh, Luis Fernando Jano and Hernani are um, amazing in their different areas. And based on what Hernani said, uh, the privilege it was to talk to you based on a document, which to me, when I did this research in uh, 2000, whatever, 2002, or three, regarding the uh, visit of King Albert, I'm reading my papers here. I once I wrote, there, I read the news that two sergeants uh, would come with King Albert. And I wrote, would it be possible to see this film? I asked myself, and here we are, you know, 20 years later discussing this film and everybody can watch it now. And with regards to the other two films, these are classics regarding the city for you who likes Rio de Janeiro, but also movie in general, to rethink this uh, relation between the city uh, and uh, its archives. And as Fernando said, and the motive also behind our meeting, this amazing meeting and this necessary project, which is Human Memorias, this uh, file can only work because we ask the questions from the present and not the questions from the past. So the importance of these films within a, a architectural conference in a key moment in Rio de Janeiro and within the structure that we offered here, uh, it is for us to always value the library, the document, the archives, not because it shows us the past, but also because it allows us to ask the right questions and understand how we can um, go through these different historical times that a story that a history the story produces. So, Livia, thank you so much. Thank you all. I would like to thank you all. I wouldn't say I shouldn't say anything more. I should close right here. But Ehnani invited me, so I will briefly say something. I would like to make a link, uh, maybe a curiosity, and then uh, you can uh, make your own links. The uh, decree for the demolition of the hill was approved in August 20, 1920, and the kings arrived uh, one month later. So they went to the Monroe Palace, and just as a this is just a curiosity of this, just a detail uh, which links these three things, but uh, on all the rest you're very referred to. So I'd like to thank you very much, uh, jean -Lo, since the beginning, you were uh, truly enthusiastic about this proposal. You really uh, embraced uh, these uh, films. You really helped us. And Human Modis, uh, we have, of course, exhibits and galleries that will uh, sort of be an image of physical museum. But it, these are important things that will help us uh, think about uh, urban transformations. One is Rio Cidade in Transformação, Rio, a city in transformation, talking about the transformations of the city since its foundation until now, like the films also show, uh, with the dismantling of the hill, you go uh, all the way back to the foundation of the city, because the Rio Morro do Castelo is where the city actually started, and uh, we'll go through today the Vila Autódromo, and uh, as Eduardo Ages in the Chronicle of the Demolition will show how the demolition of the hill was happened. And so Rio Cidade de Transformação 
I invite you to visit this gallery in the Virtual Museum in Rio Sinete. This is also a partnership with Hernani and with the uh, Museum of Modern Art uh, Film Library. These are short films with uh, very few images. And uh, the uh, film library made this available, and it's there for you to see. These are there for free. These are 10 minutes shorts. And next month, we'll have another one in the library. And the idea is to have one a short uh, movie, uh, one short movie every month. And these are images from the beginning of the century. And they're very interesting to watch. So, so uh, for people to join tomorrow and to participate tomorrow, in this debate uh, for tomorrow, they, how do they join? Yeah, what, what is the link? Good question. Because uh, I want to know. <laughs> so the films are available on the uh, Vimeo channel at the, the uh, Mom, uh, Film Library and the debates are on YouTube, both on Mom Hiu as well as Hume Mata's YouTube channel. And it's important to say that we have simultaneous interpretation for the, there's a YouTube channel with simultaneous interpretation into English. If you are a foreigner and wish to listen to, if, if you want to invite your foreign guests, so it's on the YouTube and uh, Facebook. But uh, simultaneous interpretation is just on YouTube. And so tomorrow we're together again. Oh Thank, you <laughs> Thank you very much. It's important to say that the films are available. Uh, uh, so even if you can't see it tomorrow or the day after, uh, it's they will be available until the 25th. So the films will be made available. And uh, both the Chronicle of Demolition and uh, uh, Sinai Zganzela and Eduardo Alves will participate, and we will have the opportunity to hear from them. We have the creators, the artists, talking about their vision and uh, and what mobilized them in a certain way to revisit the past of the city and uh, these uh, specific spaces in the story of the city. And uh, Livia, you can give our address uh, for the virtual museum where people can. Uh, you know, stay longer and find their interactions and discover other materials, not only films, but other materials and uh, text in the perspective that Fred presented, which is to reflect like we did today regarding these documents. <laughs> can't, can't we have it until the end of the month, Hernani? We can talk about it, and we will we'll do that. I'll try to do that. It would be so nice. There are so many people of which who want to see. It would be worthwhile, maybe. Let's say this uh, a month of partying. So I will ask them, and we have already received some requests in this sense because the uh, exhibit, which started actually on the 15th, has been very successful. More than a thousand uh, visualizations. If it was, uh, if it was uh, on site, it would be uh, five uh, full theaters for these films. So that's amazing. So it will, it will probably reach a greater public. So some people have written saying, "Well, allow us to have a little bit longer, some until the end of the year." So on the thirty-first. I guess we can negotiate that. We will do our best to the, the 21st. Well, you can do anything. I, I'm not that powerful, but this is something important, even for the films, for the work that is being done and for the event and for the repercussion it will have within the, um, the international conference. Okay, thank you so much, Anani. Thank you. It would be important really to have this. So the, uh, it's humanmodest.com.br and you, I invite you all to visit us there and to navigate. And the idea is to bring to light uh, stories that are unknown for the public and sometimes erased. So thank you so much, Ehnani. Thank you, uh, Fred. I thank you all for your participation.
And to the public who's watching us today in Portuguese and English, I would like to thank all the technical team, uh, you know, behind the scenes here supporting us and uh, helping us with this transmission, a perfect transmission of this event. And uh, also, I'd like to invite all of you to uh, follow us on our social media uh, for uh, UIA 2021 with different attractions. We have different meetings uh, for architecture and urbanism and uh, continue to see all the different films, get to know your memorias and follow us in general, follow the program on the digital channels and uh, the general programming of the uh, Museum of Modern Art, which offers uh, everything within art and culture. Thank you very much. Good evening. And I see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. No food, I'm Fred. <laughs>